Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. August 2019, the Parliament approved amendments to the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act or UAPA. Because of these amendments, the central government is empowered that you can categorize any individual as a terrorist. Now there are two groups. Group 1 believes that tougher laws are needed to tackle terrorism and these amendments make UAPA a tougher law and that is what is required in our fight against terrorism. Then there is group 2 which believes that this law can be misused against political dissidents, against minorities, against human rights activists, so on and so forth. So we have two extremes. Extreme 1 believes that we finally have a tough law against terror. And then there is another extreme which cries that UAPA is the most dangerous law yet. In this lecture, let us analyze the arguments of both the groups, but first up, a brief background of UAPA. The year was 1967. The parliament enacted Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. Prior to that, a resolution was passed by National Integration Council headed by the Prime Minister. National Integration Council resolution urged the Indian Parliament that you should frame a law which should tackle unlawful activities and unlawful organizations. And based on this resolution, the Indian Parliament enacted UAPA in the year 1967. But what was the objective of UAPA? The objective was, if there is an unlawful organization, ban it. The objective was, we should penalize and punish those who are the members of these unlawful organizations. The objective was, if you are an individual and you support these unlawful organizations, we should punish you. The objective was, if you are an individual and you fund these unlawful activities, you fund these unlawful organizations, we should punish you as well. So broadly, if we look at the UAPA of 1967, it had three major objectives. Objective number one, if the central government believes that a particular organization is or has become unlawful, ban it. Objective number two, if you are a member of these unlawful organizations, we will punish you. Objective number three, if you are funding these unlawful organizations or if you deal with the funds of these unlawful organizations, there is a punishment for you under the UAPA of 1967. This law has been amended seven times. The seventh amendment in the year 2019. Prior to 2019, this law has been amended six times. 1969, 1972, 1986, 2004, 2008, 2013. Substantial amendments were made in the year 2008 and 2013. We will discuss what is the combined effect of all these amendments. And then we will talk about the amendments of 2019. So first, we will discuss the combined effect of all these amendments to UAPA till the year 2013. UAPA now deals with two kinds of acts. Unlawful acts and terrorist acts. Now you might ask, what is the difference between an unlawful act and a terrorist act? I'll tell you the difference. The 1967 UAPA only talked about unlawful activities and unlawful organizations. Any individual committing unlawful activities, the law will punish that individual. And if an organization is an unlawful organization, the central government will issue a notification and ban this unlawful organization. Then the scope of UAPA was expanded. Expanded to cover terrorist acts as well. Now UAPA also bans terrorist organizations. Now, UAPA also punishes those who are involved in terrorist activities. That means 1967 law banned unlawful organizations and punishes the members of unlawful organizations. Now, because of all these amendments, the scope of the law was expanded to cover even the terrorist organizations. So if there is an organization which the central government believes is a terrorist organization, the central government will ban that organization. 
and if you are a member of these terrorist organizations you support these terrorist organizations you fund these terrorist organizations there is a punishment for you under uapa but what is the difference between an unlawful act and a terrorist act there is a difference although these terms are used interchangeably but there is a difference where is the difference unlawful activity is defined under section 2o of the uapa now what is an unlawful activity if i commit an act which is against the unity integrity and sovereignty of the nation but i commit this act not through bombs not through ammunition not through weapons not through firearms but through words whether these words are spoken or written through pictorial representation that means i am committing an act against the unity integrity and sovereignty of the nation but through my words through my actions through my pictorial representations through cartoons as well that is what we call an unlawful activity and if you are committing this unlawful activity we will punish you and if you are a member of an unlawful organization that organization also shall be banned this is similar to section 124 capital a of the indian penal code which deals with sedition that means unlawful activities can be equated with sedition which is covered under section 124 capital a of the indian penal code that is why many people argue that since we have uapa there is no need to have sedition law because both these laws deal with similar kind of offenses but be that as it may this is what an unlawful activity is now what is a terrorist act terrorist act is also similar in the sense that if you are acting against the unity integrity and sovereignty of the nation but how through firearms through ammunition through weapons through landmines and because of these acts it may lead to deaths of individuals it may lead to injuries to individuals it may lead to destruction of any property and if you are committing these acts against the unity integrity and sovereignty of the nation and you are committing these acts through these acts it leads to the death of individuals injuries to individuals destruction of the property of individuals or the state it is a terrorist act and if you are committing a terrorist act uapa will punish you that means there are provisions under uapa which deals with terrorist acts as well now what is the punishment for a terrorist act if you are committing a terrorist act and this act leads to death of innocents then you will be sentenced to either life imprisonment or death but if this terrorist act leads to destruction of property injuries to individuals you may be sentenced to life imprisonment you may be sentenced to a prison term which is not less than 5 years that means punishment of 5 years or more till life imprisonment if your terrorist act leads to injuries to individuals or destruction of the private or public property that's how terrorist act is defined under uapa that means prior to 2019 the combined effect of all these amendments to uapa were that number 1 uapa deals with unlawful activities as well as terrorist acts uapa bans unlawful organizations as well as terrorist organizations and there is a punishment mentioned under uapa for those committing unlawful activities and those committing terrorist acts as well after the uapa of 1967 we had two other major laws against terror one was tada terrorist and disruptive activities prevention act and pota prevention of terrorism act both these acts have been repealed why because the then government believed that these laws have been misused overused abused and that is why we don't need these laws these two anti terror legislations were repealed by the parliament now today one principal anti terror legislation that we have in this country is uapa in august 2019 both houses of indian parliament approved the amendments to uapa what are these amendments let's look at the 2019 amendments made to unlawful activities prevention act there are three major changes made to uapa and we will discuss all these three major changes one by one the first change is 
Previously, only an organization could have been declared as an unlawful organization or a terrorist organization. Now, even an individual can be declared as a terrorist. That means previously, if I'm an accused in a terrorism case, I'm only an accused, I'm only a terror accused. Once the FIR is filed, charge sheet is filed, then the courts pronounce that yes, you are guilty, then I am declared as a terrorist. That means through a legal process, I was declared as a terrorist. Now, even without a legal process, if the central government believes that a particular individual is committing a terrorist act, is planning a terrorist act, is supporting a terrorist act, or is otherwise involved in terrorism, this particular individual can be declared by the central government as a terrorist. What is the process? If the central government believes that an individual A is a terrorist, his name will be added to the schedule to UAPA and ultimately this person shall be designated as a terrorist. But one important thing, when my name is added to the schedule, to UAPA, I am not even asked for a clarification. That means even without me defending myself, my name is mentioned in the schedule to UAPA and I am declared as a terrorist. One major change in 2019. Now even individuals can be designated as a terrorist. Change number two. Let's say for example, I am an officer of NIA. NIA is a principal investigating agency which deals with the terrorist activities and acts of crime related to terrorism. Now I am an officer of NIA and I want to conduct a raid in let's say West Bengal. What would happen? The earlier UAPA would say that if I have to conduct a raid in West Bengal, if I have to seize the property of a terror accused, I have to take the permission of the Director General of Police of West Bengal. This was the earlier UAPA. Now the change made in 2019 says, if I'm an investigating officer of NIA and I have to conduct a raid in West Bengal, I have to seize the property of a terror accused in West Bengal. I don't have to seek the permission of the Director General of Police of West Bengal. But what I have to do, I have to seek the permission of the Director General of NIA. Many people believe that this principle violates federalism. How can a central agency, NIA, enter into a state, not report to the Director General of Police of that state, but report to Director General of NIA? But we will discuss that in detail slightly later. But this is the second big change. If I'm an investigating officer, I have to conduct a raid. I have to arrest an individual. I have to seize the property of a terror accused. I only have to now seek the permission and sanction of the Director General of NIA. Change number two. Now, what is the change number three? The earlier UAPA said that all these cases of terrorism shall be investigated by an officer of the rank of DYSP, Deputy Superintendent of Police. Now, the 2019 amendment says, no, even an inspector of NIA is authorized to conduct investigation in any terror-related case which is investigated by NIA. So basically, 2019 amendments focus on three major changes to UAPA. Change number one, an individual can now be designated as a terrorist. Change number two, if you are conducting an investigation in a state, you don't have to seek the permission of the Director General of Police of that state if you have to conduct a raid, if you have to seize the property of a terror accused. Change number three. Now even inspector rank individual officer of the NIA will be in a position to conduct the investigation in a terror related case. These are the three major changes, three major amendments to UAPA. Now let's look at the arguments in favor of these amendments and arguments against these amendments. And at the end, we will discuss whether UAPA should continue or not. Let's look at the arguments in favor of Unlawful Activities Prevention Act with particular focus on the 2019 amendments. Argument number one, the Masood Azhar case. We were pleading with the world powers, United States, France, UK, even China, that you should help us so that United Nations Security Council shall designate Masood Azhar as a global terrorist. Newspaper reports tell us that when Indian officers 
were convincing the foreign powers. These foreign powers would ask the Indian officials, why are you not designating Masood Azhar as a global terrorist? You are asking us that we should help you so that Masood Azhar is designated as a global terrorist. But why are you not doing it on your own? The fact is, our law did not allow it. The law of 1967 and after the repeated amendments till 2013 only allowed the central government to designate an organization as a terrorist organization. There was no provision under UAPA or under any other law of Indian parliament that we can declare an individual also as a terrorist. Now this legal loophole has been done away with. Now any individual also can be designated as a terrorist by the central government. That's argument number one. Argument number two, individuals floating new organizations. For example, Hafiz Saeed. He started a terror organization called lashkar e -Taiba. United Nations banned this organization. Then what Hafiz Saeed did? He started another organization and named it jamaat ud -Dawa. All the funds of lashkar e -Taiba were diverted to jamaat ud -Dawa. All the members of the lashkar e -Taiba became the members of the jamaat ud -Dawa. So if you are banning an organization, but you are not banning an individual of these organizations, what will happen? These individuals will float another organization. Then if this organization is also banned, these individuals will float another organization and this vicious cycle continues. That is why the only solution to deal with such a problem is that we should also designate an individual as a terrorist. That's another argument in favor of these 2019 amendments. Third argument, lone wolf. What is that? There have been instances in the past, as recent as in New Zealand, when an individual attacked a mosque at Christchurch in New Zealand and killed more than 50 individuals. There may be individuals who may be acting on their own. There is an individual who is committing a terrorist act, who is committing an unlawful act, but this individual may not necessarily be part of any organization, any terror organization. So there are lone wolves and we have to tackle these lone wolves as well. That is why there should be a law which can designate an individual also as a terrorist. That's another argument in favor of the UAPA amendments of 2019. Now four, deterrent. This tougher law would act as a deterrent and people will think twice, thrice or n number of times before they commit a terrorist act, before they commit an unlawful activity. How? There is an individual who will now fear the law that even I can be designated as a terrorist. My property can be confiscated. I can be put behind the bars. There can be a ban on my travel. There can be an arms embargo on me. So if all these effects would result, if I am designated as a terrorist, it would act as a very strong deterrent and will prevent future commission of crimes. That's another argument in favor of a strong anti-terror law. Then we have, if organizations can be declared as terrorist organizations, but who makes up these organizations? Individuals. If individuals make up an organization and if organizations can be designated as terrorist organizations, why can't we designate individuals who make up these organizations also as terrorists? Another argument. United Nations has a provision for declaring an individual as a terrorist. That is how Hafiz Saeed, that is how Masood Azhar in May 2019 was designated as a global terrorist. Other world powers also, such as United States, they have a provision where they can designate an individual as a terrorist. Why should India lag behind? So now India has also joined United Nations and other world powers in having a strong anti-terror law where even an individual can be designated as a terrorist. Another argument. There are critics to these UAPA amendments and they criticize these amendments on three major grounds. And we will tackle all these arguments one by one. The first criticism is that now an inspector of NIA is authorized to conduct an investigation in a terror related case. Previously, it was a DYSP level individual who would carry out the investigation. Now, the critics believe that there will be no oversight on an inspector. 
and this inspector will misuse, overuse and abuse these amendments. Now this argument may not be justified. Why? If an inspector is conducting an investigation in a terror related case, it is not an inspector taking a decision on his own. This file will go all the way up to Director General of NIA. That means it will be a collective decision of NIA when an individual is designated as a terrorist. An inspector alone will not be in a position to take such a decision. That means there is a DG level scrutiny whenever terror related cases are investigated by inspectors. And on top of that, we have dearth of personnel. We have dearth of officers. If only DYSP level officers are authorized to carry out investigation in a terror related case, we are in dearth of officers. That is why we should go a step down and also include inspectors who are by the way professionals. These inspectors would also carry out investigation so that investigations are carried out in a swift manner, in a time bound manner and ultimately we are in a position to tackle the menace of terrorism. That's the argument. Then there is another argument in favor of these amendments. The argument given by the critics is that if NIA officer who is investigating a terror related case, he conducts an investigation in West Bengal, but he can raid a person in West Bengal. He can seize the property of an individual of West Bengal without involving the director general of police. What it means? It means you are attacking the federal system of this country. This argument may also not be a valid. Why? Because we have seen that in terror related cases, there can be political patronage as well. The government of West Bengal, the government of XYZ state may create impediments in the path of a strong impartial investigation into a terror related case. And that is why we have seen less and less convictions under UAPA, for example. So that this political patronage is done away with. That is why these amendments say that now if an investigating officer of NIA is conducting a raid in West Bengal or in any other state, the permission of the director general of police of that state is not required. The permission and sanction of the director general of NIA is required. That means it is not going against the principles of federalism in this country, but it is only making the anti-terror laws in this country very strong so that there is no political patronage to terrorist organizations or to unlawful organizations. That's the argument in favor of these UAPA amendments. Then there is another criticism. The criticism says that if I am designated as a terrorist, I am not heard. That means even without hearing me, the central government believes that I'm a terrorist. My name is added to the schedule and I'm designated as a terrorist. Where is the safeguard? There is a safeguard embedded within the law itself. What is the safeguard? If I am designated as a terrorist, my name is added to the schedule of UAPA and I am a designated terrorist now. There is a provision under UAPA that I can challenge my designation as a terrorist. All I have to do, I have to file a petition with the central government. The central government may reject because central government designated me as a terrorist. Why would central government accept my petition? If the central government rejects my petition, then within 30 days, I can file another petition. And this time a committee shall be set up by the central government. It will be headed by a retired or sitting judge of a high court. It will have three other members as well. That means my case will now be heard by an independent committee and this committee will go through the facts of my case, will go through the arguments of the central government, will go through my arguments as well and then decide whether I am a terrorist or not. Even if this committee rejects my application, there is always the door of the Supreme Court open for me. I can knock the doors of the judiciary in this country. That means there is three tier safeguard available under UAPA. Three tier safeguard available that if you think you have been wronged by the state, if you think you have been unjustifiably designated as a terrorist by the state, there is always a safeguard available for you. There is always a provision under the law which you can use so that if a wrong has been committed against you, there is a potential, there is a provision where this wrong can be rectified. These are the arguments in favor of the amendments, 2019 amendments to UAPA. 
So what are we discussing today? We are discussing UAPA, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. We discussed the law of 1967. We discussed how this 1967 law has been amended multiple times till 2013 and what is the combined effect of all these amendments. Then we talked about the amendments of 2019 and then we discussed the arguments in favor of these 2019 amendments. Now let's discuss the arguments against the amendments to UAPA. But before we discuss the arguments against UAPA, let's listen in to what the Home Minister of India has to say about UAPA. Manivar UAPA me vekti vishesh ko kab atankwadi ghusit kiya jayega? Iska pravda nahi. Atankwadi kare karta hai ya usme bhag leta hai? Ab isme do rai hoti ho sakti hai kya? कोई व्यक्ति आतंकवादी कार्य करेगा या भाग लेगा तो उसको आतंकवादी घोषित करना चाहिए या नहीं करना चाहिए मान्यवर उसके लिए आतंकवाद को पोषण देने के लिए तैयारी करने के लिए जो मदद करता है अब उसको भी आतंकवादी घोषित करना चाहिए आतंकवाद को अभिवृद्धि देने के लिए धन मुहैया कराता है तो मैं मानता हूं उसको भी आतंकवादी घोषित करना चाहिए और आतंकवाद के साहित्य को और आतंकवाद की थियोरी को युवाओं के जहन में उतारने के लिए जो प्रयास करता है मान्यवर मैं मानता हूं आतंकवाद बंदूक से पैदा नहीं हो सकता आतंकवाद को फैलाने के लिए जो अपप्रचार होता है उन्माद फैलाया जाता है वो आतंकवाद का मूल है और मान्यवर अगर इन सब को आतंकवादी घोषित करते हैं तो मैं मानता हूं सदन के किसी भी सदस्य को इसके अंदर कोई आपत्ति नहीं होनी चाहिए if you listen to what the Home Minister has said clearly and accurately, this is very wide. The definition of unlawful activity or a terrorist activity is very wide. And anybody or everybody who disagrees with the government can be labeled as a terrorist. How? Let's go back to 1976. Mrs. Indira Gandhi imposed emergency in this country. What is the most negative, memorable thing about emergency? preventive detention. The law called MISA, Maintenance of Internal Security Act. Anybody who disagreed with the government, anybody who disagreed with Mrs. Gandhi was arrested. Or anybody who dared to disagree with Mrs. Gandhi was arrested under MISA. Why? Because they were labeled as anti-nationals. So anybody who is against the government or who dares to disagree with the government can now be labeled as a terrorist. 1976, when this law was challenged in the Supreme Court, a five-judge bench of the Supreme Court decided that all these arrests are legal. That means even the habeas corpus, which was suspended during the time of emergency, even the suspension of habeas corpus is justified in the name of national security, in the interest of the sovereignty, integrity and security of the nation. Only one judge dissented, Justice Khanna. Justice Khanna said that even during emergency, Article 21 is the bedrock of Indian constitution. Habeas corpus cannot be suspended. But he was in a minority. Four other judges decided that this MISA law is constitutional. If you look at Article 21 of the Indian constitution, it talks about right to life. But Supreme Court has said, what is this life? Life does not mean physical act of breathing. Life is not only that you are allowing individuals to breathe and that is what right to life is. Right to life includes a right to live with dignity. Right to life means right to reputation as well. Now this is what is happening. I am labeled a terrorist. There is no FIR. There is no charge sheet. There is no trial. There is no conviction. Even without a judicial process, I am declared as a terrorist. What happens to my dignity? What happens to my reputation? It's all gone. How? I'll tell you something very, very serious. When United Nations declare somebody as a terrorist, then what happens? There are some consequences that follow. What are these consequences? There will be a travel ban imposed on this individual. There will be an arms embargo on this individual. He cannot procure arms. His property will be confiscated. His funds will be sealed. 
by the state, by the United Nations organizations. That is the consequence when United Nations designate somebody as a terrorist. What under you are, You may not even be arrested. There may not even be a charge sheet. There may not even be an FIR. Your property may not even be confiscated. But just a label will be there that you are a terrorist. That means this law is truncated. This law is not even complete. If you are designating somebody as a terrorist, there should be some consequences to follow as well. But there are no consequences mentioned under UAPA. The government officials say that once this law is enacted, then we will frame rules and regulations. And these rules and regulations will decide what are the consequences that will follow once an individual is designated as a terrorist. But as of now, there are no consequences. So what will happen to me? I am designated as a terrorist by the government. I filed an appeal. The central government rejected this. Within 30 days, I filed another appeal. The committee appointed by the same central government rejects this. Then I approach the judiciary. And this process can take 100 days, minimum 100 days. For these 100 days, what will happen? There will be a social boycott against me. My landlord will say, please vacate this premise. My organization might say, you are removed from the job. There will be mob justice now. That means if I am moving around, I am exposed to vigilante justice as well. How? I am moving around. There is a label at my forehead that I am a terrorist declared by the central government. This opens up avenues, opportunities for a mob to lynch me. Without any process, without any due process, I am lynched by a mob. And who can question the mob? They are doing an honorable thing, killing a terrorist. How can killing a terrorist be declared as some dishonorable thing? They are doing an honorable thing to kill me because I am a terrorist. Maybe an innocent can also be designated as a terrorist. And if we look at the instances, how UAPA has been misused over a period of time. Human rights activists have been arrested under UAPA. Those who are critical of the construction of dams have been arrested under UAPA. Those who are talking about the rights of the tribals and the Adivasis of this country have been arrested under UAPA. So all these individuals, we are equating them with Hafiz Saeeds. We are equating them with Maulana Masood Azhar's. There has to be a difference between a Masood Azhar and those who are working for tribal rights. Those who are working for the upliftment of the Dalits in this country. Those who are working for environmentalism. But even all these individuals who work for just causes can be designated as terrorists by the central government if the central government believes that they are terrorists. That means Article 21 is clearly violated by these 2019 amendments. Anybody who disagrees with the government can be declared as a terrorist. That's what the critics feel. And if you look at carefully what the Honorable Home Minister is saying, somebody propagating the ideology of terrorism can also be designated as a terrorist. But this is a very vague phrase. Somebody propagating the ideology of terrorism. Let's say, for example, the most famous Urdu poet, Faiz Ahmad Faiz, is viewed as a revolutionary poet. He says, Hum dekhenge, lazim hai ki hum bhi dekhenge. Wo din jiska vada hai, jo lohe azal mein likha hai. Sab taaj uchale jayenge, sab takht giraye jayenge. He's talking about revolution. But that revolution which helps the poor, which helps the downtrodden, which eradicates inequality in this country. Even this poetry, this revolutionary poetry can be viewed as a propaganda, can be viewed as an ideology which supports terrorism. And as such an individual can also be designated as a terrorist. That is why many people believe that these amendments go very far and as such violate Article 21, which is right to life with dignity, with reputation of the Constitution of India. That is what is mentioned in these two paragraphs. An official designation will be akin to, will be similar to civil death with social boycott, expulsion from job, hounding by media and perhaps attack from self-proclaimed vigilante groups. In short, the government can declare anybody as a terrorist without following any judicial procedure and throw him to mob to suffer extra judicial punishment. That's the criticism of these UAPA amendments.
something else also happens. If I am designated as a terrorist, the burden of proof shifts. What is this burden of proof? Normally, if this is a criminal case and I'm an accused in a criminal case, it is for the prosecution. It is for the state to prove, to convince before the judiciary that I am a terrorist, that I have committed this crime. That means the burden of proof is on the prosecution. That means prosecution has to prove beyond any reasonable doubt that I am a criminal and then the judiciary will punish me. But here, because of these UAPA amendments, something else happens. The burden of proof shifts. The burden of proof shifts to an accused. If I'm a terrorist designated by the central government, I have to convince and prove to the judiciary that I am not a terrorist. And it is very, very difficult to prove the mighty state wrong. It is very difficult to prove the state machinery wrong when an individual is designated as a terrorist. Even the burden of proof shifts. Now you might ask that if I'm repeatedly talking about Article 21 of the Constitution of India, but this Article 21 is not absolute. There are restrictions to Article 21. And the restrictions are procedure established by law. That means Article 21 states, the state shall not deprive an individual of his right to life and personal liberty, except according to the procedure established by law. That means this right to life is not an absolute fundamental right. But look at this paragraph carefully. The right to reputation is an intrinsic part of Article 21 of the Constitution of India. And tagging an individual as a terrorist, even before the commencement of a trial, violates procedure established by law. That means again, Article 21 is getting violated. Article 21 is getting diluted because of these amendments. These amendments also violate International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. If you look at Article 6 of this covenant, India is a signatory to this covenant. Article 6 states every human being has an inherent right to life. This right shall be protected by law and no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his life. When nobody shall be arbitrarily deprived of his life, hear what you are doing. If the central government believes that you are a terrorist, your right to life is snatched arbitrarily. Your right to reputation is snatched arbitrarily. Your right to dignity is snatched arbitrarily. And then right to privacy is also violated. How? The police will knock at my door 3 a.m. at the dead of the night and will whisk me away. My privacy is also violated because of these amendments. Critics argue that because of these amendments, we are going back to the emergency days. And in emergency days, there was a phrase used commonly for all these political detentions because basically all those individuals who were arrested under MISA they were not anti-national elements they were political dissidents they were politicians activists student leaders who dared to disagree with the government of the day who dared to disagree with the dictatorial tendencies of the government of the day and the phrase used was na vakil na dalil na appeal so there is one section which believes that this is a tough law and we have discussed their arguments there is another section which believes that we support UAPA, but these amendments go way too far. And that is why these amendments should not be approved, should be struck down by the judiciary. Then there is another group, which I didn't tell you in the beginning, but I'm telling you now. There is a group which believes that even UAPA should be declared unconstitutional. The whole UAPA should be repealed. Just like Pota, Tada were repealed, UAPA also should be repealed. What are the arguments of these individuals who believe that UAPA as a whole should be declared unconstitutional? Number one, this group believes that if unlawful activity is banned under UAPA, but this phrase unlawful activity is very vague. People protesting against the construction of dams, people protesting for the tribal rights, people protesting for the Dalit rights, people protesting in favor of the disempowered, disprivileged sections of the society, their actions can also be declared as unlawful activity and as such these individuals can be arrested. And that is what has happened in the recent past. If you look at the Battle of Koregaon, which was fought in 1818, where the soldiers of East India Company defeated the Marathas. The Marathas, the Peshwas, they were predominantly Brahmins. The soldiers of the East India Company 
they were the Dalits. And this Battle of Koregaon was won by the soldiers of the British East India Company. And every year, the Dalits in Maharashtra and in other places, they celebrate the victory of the Battle of Koregaon. And then what happened? Some activists who participated in the celebration of the Battle of Koregaon, they were booked under UAPA. That's one argument. Why UAPA should be declared unconstitutional. Then there is another argument. Whoever is a member of an unlawful organization will also be penalized. But how do we define the membership of an organization? How do we define who is a member of an unlawful organization? Who is a member of a terrorist organization? Let's say, for example, I'm a researcher. I'm conducting a research on the separatists of Jammu and Kashmir. I'm conducting a research on the Maoist and Naxalites in this country. I have to read their literature so that I understand what is their ideology. I may also have to participate in their meetings so that I can look how they communicate to the masses. How do they propagate their ideology to the masses? Even I can be arrested and declared as a terrorist or a member of an unlawful organization. Because when we say that even members of these unlawful organizations and terrorist organizations can be penalized, this term membership is so vague that anybody who participates in their meetings can also be penalized. Anybody who has a literature of these organizations can also be penalized. And this goes against the Supreme Court verdict of 2011 in Indra Das versus State of Assam. The Supreme Court had made it abundantly clear that if there is an individual who possesses the literature of a banned organization, who participates in the meetings of banned organizations, that doesn't mean this individual is a member of these organizations. This individual can be deemed as a member of these unlawful organizations only and only if he incites people to violence. That means unless and until I incite people to violence, it doesn't matter whether I am in possession of a literature of a banned organization, whether I'm participating in the meetings of a banned organization, it doesn't matter. But here the membership is so vague that even if you participate in the meetings of these banned organizations, you may be called as a member of a terrorist organization or a member of unlawful organization. That is why some people believe that UAPA should be repealed. Then there is another argument. Absence of a bail or an anticipatory bail. And that has something to do with section 43D5 of the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. In 1970s, late 1970s, the Supreme Court made it clear. Jail is an exception. Bail is a norm. As much as possible, release individuals on bail. If an individual is not a threat to public property, release him on bail. If an individual accused cannot tamper with the evidence, cannot threaten with the witnesses, cannot run away from this country, release this individual on bail, otherwise keep him in jail. But here under UAPA, there is section 43D5 of the Act, which says, that if the police presents a case diary or if the police presents a charge sheet and because of the case diary and the charge sheet, the judiciary can be convinced that prima facie, there is a case against this accused, prima facie, this individual is guilty, no bail should be awarded to this individual. What I'm trying to say is that there are people who believe that the whole law UAPA is against the human rights, is against dissent in this country. It criminalizes dissent in this country and as such, UAPA should be removed, UAPA should be repealed. What are these arguments? Number one, this term unlawful activity is very vague. Number two, who is the member of these unlawful organizations? Very vague. Number three, denial of bail. If the police presents a case diary or a charge sheet before the judiciary, and through this case diary and charge sheet, the judiciary can be convinced that prima facie, this individual is guilty. No bail can be given to this individual. Now you would say, what is the problem here? If the case diary and the charge sheet says that you are guilty. But case diary and charge sheet, they are the virgins of the state. The state is saying you are guilty. How can judiciary go by the arguments of the state 
and deny the liberty, freedom, life guaranteed by Article 21 of the Constitution of India to an accused. That is why UAPA should be revoked according to some activists. That brings us to the closure of this lecture. In this lecture, we talked about UAPA. We talked about arguments in favor of UAPA, arguments against the amendments of 2019. We also talked about the arguments against the entire law as well. That is what is required for you to know for this examination. Thank you for being with us. Have a great day.